Well, thank you, Owen, for a kind introduction, and thank you especially for the hard work that's gone into organizing this exceptional meeting. Speaking for uh, NIH and all the folks who are here, we're really welcoming this opportunity to hear from the community about where we need to go next with this very exciting area of science, which is just bursting uh, with opportunity and potential uh, for understanding aspects of human health that had been outside of our reach until recently and, and are now coming forward in a way that all of us are truly excited about. And as Owen has said, we are at a critical juncture here where the microbiome project, having uh, lived for a while in the Common Fund, is now moving out into lots of other territories, lots of institutes involved. And it is a great moment uh, to hear from all of you about where those opportunities are most compelling. We at NIH uh, live, unfortunately, in challenging times uh, when it comes to resources uh, with things like the sequester having put us in a historically difficult position as far as being able to support all the science we would like to, all the more reason why we have to think carefully about how to set priorities and getting input uh, from the scientists in this room on this topic is a great example of the kind of thing that we're trying to do more and more of. So, Owen, thank you and your team uh, of organizers uh, for making this possible. Believe me, uh, NIH is uh, listening, participating, delighted this is happening. My task, I think, is to basically set very briefly a little bit of the historical context here, and then I'm going to pass off to Eric Green, who can tell you where we are right now in terms of the things that uh, NIH has supported in this human microbiome project. And then that will sort of make it possible for all those uh, speakers who follow over the next couple of days uh, to go forward uh, from that with exciting new ideas. And that's exactly what I think the intention is of the meeting. Uh, my title here, I thought about a bit, and you could basically blame me for being a little hyperbolic here with uh, all of these superlatives, supercharging and superorganism, and not to mention the attempt at alliteration here. Uh, but it is a superorganism we're talking about in terms of the interactions between host and microbes. And the way in which uh, we would like to see that move forward is to move that science in ever more powerful directions to understand how that works, uh, how disruptions in that superorganism uh, result in health uh, in, in disease, and what we could do about it. So very briefly, in terms of the background, this certainly fits uh, the mission of the NIH uh, quite powerfully and compellingly. You may know NIH has this twofold mission of fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems, but also the application of that knowledge to extend healthy life and reduce illness and disability. Microbiome fits smack in the middle uh, of this uh, longstanding mission of the largest supporter of biomedical research in the world, the National Institutes of Health. Going back to uh, sort of the historical side of this, you could say that microbiome was a very natural fit for NIH, going back to our very original origins. Uh, many people aren't aware NIH was actually established a little over 125 years ago uh, as a hygienic lab testing samples for infectious disease in a small laboratory, not here in Bethesda at that point, but on Staten Island. And over the course of time, of course, NIH playing roles in many other ways that feed into what we're going to talk about as far as the microbiome, including, as you can see, the photograph here of uh, Nirenberg, uh, the Genome Project, of course, fitting in here. And interestingly, uh, wondering where uh, this genomic return to microbiology comes from and where uh, the term microbiome first arose. Uh, it seems that it came forward in this article by Joshua Lederberg and Alexa McCray, Alexis at the National Library of Medicine, uh, where uh, the formulation of words that begin in OM uh, was put forward in a rather categorical and somewhat tongue-in-cheek way. But Lederberg, uh, very much, as you can imagine, having won the Nobel Prize for his own work in microbiology, uh, was uh, attracted to the term microbiome to signify the ecological community of commensal, symbiotic, and pathogenic microorganisms, pretty good definition, that literally share our body space and have all been ignored as determinants of health and disease. And here again, the term superorganism. We should think of each host and its parasites as a superorganism with respective uh, genomes yoked into a chimera of sorts. Uh, well said, uh, Josh. Of course, the ability to be able uh, to sample the microbiome, as we are now talking about, depended very much upon the ability to be able to collect nucleic acid information on organisms, many of which are not directly culturable. And so I'm sure much of today's conversation uh, will relate to the fact that that has become within reach because of this curve, 
as you can see, and everybody who studies genomics is fond of showing curves like this, uh, dropping the cost of a human genome uh, from $100 million back in 2001 to now, as current estimates, exactly $5,671 or thereabouts. And of course, the technology to do that uh, has advanced, and that's why this has become possible from machines that look like this, some of which, of course, are still producing lots of data, uh, to things that are more microscaled, in this case, an ion torrent, but there's lots of other competing technologies, and this has not anywhere near exhausted its potential uh, for reducing costs and increasing throughput. And that has been such a phenomenal, uh, wonderful ride to be on uh, in the microbiome, and it's, of course, in lots of other applications as well. So how did microbiome become, at NIH, a project called the HMP, and how did it find its way into support uh, through what was at one point called the Roadmap and then became the Common Fund? Uh, I asked Jane Peterson, who was engaged uh, in the early days of this, uh, to do a little walk through memory lane and remind me of sort of how this all got started. Uh, and she uh, reminded me of a Valentine's Day evening meeting at NIH, all of three hours, um, which a number of the people in the room were present for, where this idea of organizing an effort to focus on metagenomics, which ultimately I think we decided to prefer the term the microbiome project, might be a very timely thing to do, bring together investigators and sequencing capabilities and make this an effort which crosses institutes and therefore fit quite nicely into what was at that point called the roadmap, an effort that Elias Sirhuni had put together, and shortly after that became formalized uh, because of congressional authorization into the Common Fund. All of that, I think, timely because here in 2006 it was beginning to become clear there was real potential here to apply uh, the kind of DNA sequencing efforts uh, that were becoming more and more achievable uh, to do this kind of metagenomic analysis. So the argument then that this would fit nicely into the roadmap and ultimately the Common Fund uh, was a pretty convincing one because the whole point of those kinds of uh, means of support at NIH were to support projects, as you see here, that should be truly transforming, that would require participation of NIH as a whole. No single institute or outside entity would be likely to do this on their own, uh, to place the outcomes in the public domain. And again, I'm glad to hear in Owen's uh, description that's something we have to keep pushing as this moves into other sources of support. And need to develop in an incubator space to jumpstart the field because at that point it wasn't clear that the microbiome was going to move forward as swiftly as it might without that kind of incubator opportunity. And so uh, this then was uh, endorsed, brought forward fairly quickly uh, as a common fund project. Uh, lots of people worked hard on the effort to make that uh, a reality. I particularly, again, want to mention Jane Peterson and Pam McGinnis, both of whom put a huge amount of efforts into trying to organize uh, this component of what the Common Fund was going to support, and uh, put together ideas about exactly what might happen, held various workshops, collected ideas uh, from experts uh, and interested parties of all sorts and then proposed a massive microbiome, by standards of 2007, probably rather trivial by today, a massive microbial sequence project. And then articles got written about what this might look like. Uh, this is a bunch of things from 2007, just as the effort was getting underway. A logo appeared, uh, various diagrams about exactly how many more of them there are than of us, uh, which are part of all of our opening slides now when we talk about this, uh, got generated, and we are off to the races. And of course, this was not just a U.S. area of interest. Uh, the European interest had actually been there at least as early as the United States, and so it was important to put together as much as possible the international efforts through this International Human Microbiome Consortium uh, with members uh, and research programs uh, that you see listed here, and certainly going forward, we want to be sure to take full advantage of all of those connections and collaborations. Well, then I'm going to leave to Eric to describe a lot of what actually got done scientifically as a result of all this, but as you know, uh, in the course of just a few years, uh, it was possible to produce really quite a remarkable foundation of data about the structure, function, and diversity of the healthy human microbiome, a framework for research, and increasingly focus on specific disease areas uh, where the microbiome uh, seems to be playing a role. Uh, many of which are going to be discussed in much greater detail uh, at this uh, really important milestone meeting. And uh, I, out of that, I think, uh, be fair to say, um, increasingly institutes that had been participating because everybody 
at NIH is involved in some way in a common fund project as either a participant or a cheerleader, it became increasingly clear that the way this direction uh, was going would require institutes to actually embrace within their own portfolio uh, some of the clinical applications. And I want to just show you how that has come about because I think you'll be pleased to see the way in which the institutes are embracing this. Uh, this diagram, for those of you who don't know the ins and outs of NIH, uh, just shows you uh, the 27 institutes and centers uh, at NIH that make up uh, the way in which uh, our budget is allocated and the way in which decisions are made about research priorities. Uh, for the most part, uh, the Common Fund is the exception, but only represents uh, a little less than 2 percent of the budget. The rest, the 98 percent, is out here in these institutes. Before 2008, uh, you can see a few of these institutes. Uh, particularly NIGMS, for instance, and NIAID, and, and a few others here, NIDCR, and invested in this, uh, but many of the others, uh, not at that point, uh, now five years ago, uh, engaged in microbiome uh, research support. Over the course of the next few years, uh, those numbers began to grow, and now in 2013, uh, you can see a very substantial fraction of the institutes are, in fact, engaged in supporting this, recognizing the time has come uh, to take the foundational information produced by the Common Fund supported enterprise and begin to see how that plays out in health and disease. And uh, that should be seen as good news. Uh, if you try to f factor that then into funding support, uh, this graph shows you uh, for 10, 11, and 12 uh, what has happened, uh, both in terms of the number of grants and contracts, uh, which is in orange and the green, uh, which is the extramural funding, which as you can see for FY12 had climbed up uh, to about $180 million. And the expectation is because the scientific opportunity is so compelling uh, that that number uh, provided that we don't get further hammered uh, by additional budgetary uh, distress uh, ought to continue to grow. So I hope you'll see that as a sign of encouragement that we have begun to move into this phase of broad NIH interest and support uh, for the areas uh, that are represented at this meeting, and that therefore it's a very timely moment to have the input uh, from this kind of a group about how that's going and where it needs to go. Just have to mention that, of course, one of the aspects of this that feeds into another program that NIH is now putting some significant resources is, of course, the very large production uh, of data that comes out of this kind of analysis, particularly when it involves metagenomics and requires, therefore, some sophisticated analysis to know what's going on. And we have recently, uh, in a group that I asked to look at our uh, abilities to handle big data, uh, gotten the message that we have a lot of work to do here. As a result of that, uh, NIH in a number of initiatives, including one called BD2K, Big Data to Knowledge, which was just announced this week, uh, focused on trying to build additional centers of excellence uh, in computational approaches because clearly we're going to need that. And, and the microbiome is just one example, along with a variety of other approaches. Let's, what's going on in cancer genomics, the new brain initiative that's going to generate huge amounts of data from neuroscience and so on. I also have uh, basically decided we need a key person that covers this issue across all of NIH, and so we've established a new position called the uh, Associate Director for Data Science. Very nice that the acronym there is ADDS. Isn't that cute? And Eric Green, who's going to speak in a minute, is the acting uh, ADDS, uh, and we're in the process of searching for a permanent person uh, to take on that very important role. And that's going to be very relevant, I think, uh, to where microbiome uh, needs to go, because the data needs are going to be both interesting and pretty challenging. Well, I think it's fair to say uh, that the w things we have already learned in terms of health and disease, uh, with the ability now to be able to sample the microbiome, uh, certainly in the GI tract, but also in other areas uh, like skin, uh, have told us already surprising things uh, that would not have been predicted a few years ago uh, about exactly how this superorganism uh, works and how things can go awry. And I suspect much more is still to come. You have the feeling that we've just begun to scratch the surface. And uh, there's a lot of complexity here, but it's beginning uh, to look as if the fog is lifting and we're able to see some of the principles and some of the conclusions that might even become before long actionable. And you'll hear about some of those at this meeting, in fact. So I just wanted to, in a few moments there, 
kind of set the stage of how we got to this point, particularly to express uh, to all of you how much NIH is excited about this area of science, how it is one of those areas that we think has really arrived at the moment uh, where it particularly was in need of uh, nurturing uh, as a foundational effort and is now bursting with potential that all of the institutes at NIH are interested in taking part in. So congratulations again uh, to the organizers of this effort. Uh, we will look forward uh, to seeing what comes out of this. Glad that there will be a report that can all be absorbed. Uh, glad that you're webcasting this so the people not in the room can also hear the presentations and it will stimulate, I'm sure, a lot of their thinking. So many thanks to all of you. Have a great meeting. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dr. Collins, for setting the tone and staying on time. I uh, appreciate that. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Eric Green. Uh, I think he's already been introduced, so come on up. Mm -hmm.